Well, uh, good afternoon to all of you who are tuning in to this uh, lesson number two of our Living in the Times of the Sign. And uh, so we are just extremely great, grateful that you're tuning in and that you're chiming in. And so we're going to go ahead and get started with our lesson today. And so <clears throat> today's topics that we're going to cover, one is greeting uh, the seven churches, the greeting to the seven churches, and the vision of Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 1. So hopefully that you have pen and paper in hand, hopefully that you are ready to go, and you can take notes, and also know that if you need to, you can go back at a later date and chime in and get more information as uh, you need it. So let's dive into the matter of the text uh, this morning, okay? Okay, all right, here we go. The greeting to the seven churches. You find <clears throat> this greeting uh, starting really in verse four. Uh, it says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. It says, grace and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come from the seven spirits who are before the throne. <clears throat> and so uh, there it's not listed as of yet, not until you get later on. Uh, into the matter of the text, especially in verse 11 of chapter 1. But we know that the seven churches that he is writing to uh, are uh, the church at Ephesus, the church at Smyrna, the church at Pergamos, the church at Thyatira, the church at Sardis, the church at Philadelphia, and the church at Laodicea. Uh, again, you will see these be referenced individually when you get to chapters 2 and 3, which are the epistles that are written to those churches. And so... Uh, that kind of sets it up. Now, where are these cities located? I know sometimes geographically we want to know where these places are located. So, uh, they are located in what we would call eastern, or excuse me, western Turkey. Uh, they are on the Aegean Sea, and across the Aegean Sea going west is Greece. Uh, there you see, and I can actually notate this for you on the screen and help you out. So, here are the seven churches. You see them here. Uh, this is the Aegean Sea. This is Cyprus, points back to Israel, which is down here. And then this blue mass, as you see it, is the Mediterranean Sea. Now, um, here you have, them, uh, you have them numbered in chronology to where, or, or, or to how they're mentioned in chapters 2 and 3, not geographically. And so, kind of gives you a little bit of information uh, there. The one interesting note uh, that I uh, want to give you is uh, remember that on our study right here of the church, uh, a church of Colossians, or, or to the church of Colossae, the letter to the Colossians, you remember that uh, the Colossae was located in the Lycus Valley. In the Lycus Valley, there were two other cities. One is Heriopolis, and the other one was the church of Laodicea. So now as we get to uh, the church of Laodicea, always keep in mind the church of uh, Colossae. <clears throat> the Colossians. So it kind of gives you a little bit uh, different note there, but uh, also just wanted to uh, give you uh, that point of reference as well. Right. Okay, as we keep moving on, uh, the grace and peace uh, that we see um, this is a standard greeting in the New Testament. Paul used it many times, perhaps more than any other of the New Testament writers. Uh, from the book of Romans to Philemon, usually within the first four verses, except in Romans, it was in Romans chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, it is used 16 times in the New Testament. So when John uses this, it's not something that we have never seen before as scholars, but it is something that we are extremely uh, familiar with. And so... Uh, with this, uh, this grace and peace is not man-made or produced. It comes from a person or a power. Uh, we know that this grace and peace is from God. Only God can give grace and power. And so as we go through the book of Revelation, you're going to see that there's a lot of time of unrest, um, instability, a, a time where there seems to be no moral grounding or foundation. And that's why the world is searching for peace, just as they are trying to do today. But uh, however, it's not happening, and only grace can come from Jesus Christ, we know himself. Now, as we get into the matter, uh, notice there where it says, Grace uh, to you and peace from him who is and was, who is, is to come, and before the sp seven spirits before the throne, and from Jesus Christ. Now, the him that is mentioned in verse 4 
is uh, not Jesus Christ, but it is God the Father. <clears throat> and so you have to remember that we have a Trinitarian theology. We serve a Trinitarian God, and our God has displayed himself to us as three persons, as we call them, uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to look at God the Father first. It says, remember the role of the Father is provider. It is through God the Father that he has provided Jesus Christ in order to give us the grace and the peace that we need. Uh, also, where it says of him, where it says who is and was and, is who, uh, and who is to come, it is a picture of his transcendent nature, uh, that he is above all things and he is outside of all things, but at the same time, he is in uh, all things. And that is, we want to make sure that we're not being uh, pantheistic, that God is in our cell phones or in our desk. Um, but that he is in our world. The picture of his power and also of his presence uh, as well. So we see that also too. We see it talks about the seven spirits who are before the throne. Now, this is in reference to the Holy Spirit. So let's break this down to find out what it is talking about because it's not in really until you get to Revelation that you see this. This isn't the first time that Revelation, Revelation mentions the spirits or the seven spirits of God. The number seven, seven is the number of completion. Uh, God created uh, for six days <clears throat> with his work completed. He rested on the seventh. So uh, no literal seven spirits of God, but one spirit seen in perfection and in completion. Uh, the spirit is before the throne, signifying the closeness that he has with God the Father, uh, which is the Holy Spirit. And you got to remember, they're all connected. It's all the same God, but he displays himself and comes to us in these three uh, different persons. So now we get to the last of the three, which is Jesus Christ. It says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of this earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So first off, we see that Christ, <clears throat> as it gives him these monikers of description, the first one is that he is the faithful witness. John 18, 37, Pilate therefore said to him, you are a king then. I said, excuse me, are you a king then? And Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this uh, cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who hears of the truth hears my voice. So we are assured that Jesus is the witness. Now, this term faithful witness isn't the only time uh, that it is mentioned in Scripture. You can go back all the way to Revelation chapter 19, and in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, it says this, And now I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it was called Faithful and True. And so Jesus is the faithful, true witness. Uh, not only do we see uh, that he is the faithful witness, he is the firstborn from the dead, Colossians 1.18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things that he may have the preeminence. Okay, so what is this saying? What it is saying is that Jesus Christ is the first one to be born to everlasting eternal life from the dead, and using the word born there as resurrection. All right, some of you are saying now, well, wait a minute, we thought Lazarus, we thought the widow from Nain, her son, and Jairus's daughter, was. they were raised from the dead. They were raised from the dead, but they died again. They were not raised, in, they were not raised to their glorified heavenly body. Jesus Christ has, is the only one to have experienced that first, and that's why it says that he is the firstborn from the dead. Uh, from the dead. So, <clears throat> uh, he is the firstborn from the dead, signifying his prominence and his preeminence in that. He also, uh, in the next type of description that he has, uh, he is the ruler, Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, uh, the Father. And so even in other parts of scripture, we see that Christ is the supreme Lord. We don't have to wait till we get to the book of Revelation, but Revelation is the main book of the revealing of Christ as Lord and God. Uh, also, too, we see uh, him uh, being ruler, Revelation 16, 19, and, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lord. So that is what we would call a proof text from the book of Revelation in which we're studying. Uh, notice, too, it says, um, uh, the ruler of the kings of this earth, to him who has loved and washed us, 
from our sins in his blood. Folks, that is a direct picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those verses there, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have uh, everlasting life. And then also 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. And so we are guaranteed uh, of that. All right, so now his promise. Now Christ makes a promise here in verse six. It says, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we have become kings and priests. Ladies, you have become queens and priestesses. Well, first off, that is just glorious and awesome. That's what our God has done. Not only did he save us, he forgave us, he gave us his grace and his mercy, but now he is beginning to change our titles. We are now kings, we're queens, we're now priests, we're priestesses. Uh, not only has he changed our position, but he has changed our responsibilities. Our posi positions now with kings and queens, we are high and lifted up. Our duties is that we have the duties of the priest of God, the priestesses of God, meaning that we are to declare to everyone who he is. And so uh, we see this in mind. Time frame of the second advent. Verse 7, behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Uh, because of him, even so, amen. So kind of another ending, another amen. And so his coming, uh, as we see it, is not described by time. It gives us no time reference there. Uh, it gives the impression that it can be at any moment, that it is imminent. Uh, it describes the event with great clouds. This is uh, reminiscent of Matthew's gospel account. And also, too, there in the book of Acts, just as he ascended into heaven on the clouds, <clears throat> and the angels, priest, uh, the angels were there, it, they said, so Christ would come in like manner. And, and Christ and Matthew would say several times that uh, you will see the Son of Man coming from heaven with power and great glory. And so uh, the people who will see him and all the tribes of the earth, and it's, excuse me, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. <clears throat> so every person alive at that time, all those who are in heaven, uh, anyone on the earth, and uh, even those in hell will see Jesus Christ coming back as King of kings, as Lord of lords. Even, it said, notice this, even, even those who pierced him, all right, those who pierced him, that was over 2,000 years ago. Those who killed him, they're in hell. They will see him. Gives the impression that now the deceased will be alive to see him, both those who trust and those who do not. And so uh, let me give you a little bit of a side note. Notice those who pierced him. It describes Jesus being pierced by those people, excuse me, by these people, but not, but not killed. Um, remember, Jesus was in control of the events of the cross. He laid his life down. No one took it from him. No man can make God do anything that God does not want to do, and that talks about how great and glorious our God uh, truly, truly, truly is. So um, as we continue to move on uh, here uh, this morning, now we're going to get into uh, some other descriptions about who Jesus is. Here in verse 8, uh, this is the first exa uh, um, example of I am the Alpha and the Omega. All right, so Alpha Omega is the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. It gives us a picture of the pre-incarnate Christ, <clears throat> that he is before all things and he is at the end of all things. It gives us a picture that Christ was before creation. It gives us a picture that Jesus is the beginning and ending of all knowledge because uh, the alphabet is how we learn. And it also tells us that he is omniscient. He has all knowledge and all understanding, or he has complete knowledge, complete understanding, but he has all knowledge and all understanding. Uh, understanding. Uh, uh, not only that, but it says who was and is and is to come. Uh, Jesus is in the past. Jesus is in the present. Jesus is in the future. He is transcendent. He is omnipresent. So it's given us the, all the omnis here. And so with the last one uh, that we see is the almighty, a play on words to describe that describes the Roman emperor. They, they would use this to describe the Roman emperor, the almighty Roman emperor, the almighty uh, emperor Caesar Augustus. You know, they would do that. So John is now taking that away, even though we know that in the other 65 books of the Bible uh, that God is referred to as the almighty. Uh, the emperor himself was a ruler. The word 
uh, we get for autocrat comes from the word emperor or Caesar. Uh, Jesus is the ruler. He rules with all power. He is omnipotent. He has complete and all power in him. And so now we get up this morning uh, to the vision of Christ, uh, the vision of Christ. And this is where it starts in verse 9 of Revelation chapter 1, and then we'll go all the way through uh, verse 20 here for just a little bit. So it says, it says, I, John, uh, both your brother and companion in tribulation and kingdom and patience, uh, and excuse me, companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the Isle of Patmos, or the island that is called Patmos, uh, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. John to the churches. John was a fellow believer. He was a brother, a companion in the tribulation and the kingdom, and he was also in the patience of Jesus Christ. That means he was waiting patiently for Jesus to return. Tells us today that we who follow Jesus will have the same relationship with John and also the seven churches, that we are brothers and sisters, that we are in this journey together. When one of us suffer, we all suffer. Not only that, but we will face tribulations. Hello, somebody. That's what we're facing today, uh, that we are in the kingdom of God, and we need to be patient, waiting patiently, but also doing the work of the gospel until we see him face uh, to face. Um, notice this when John is writing this. He says, uh, I was on the Spirit, or I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, uh, Sunday, uh, Sunday, not the Sabbath. He's talking, uh, um, uh, it, uh, excuse me, it, it was on Sunday. It was Sunday, not the Sabbath. Should have a comma there. So let me tell you the reason why, because people get all upset about this, and, and I really don't understand why. But let me just explain it out. John was Jewish, but the church, the early church in the first century, chose to worship on Sunday. Now, why? In order to. Um, to memorialize the resurrection. That's why we have Easter Sunday. They are not being irreverent to God and to the fourth commandment, uh, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. It is, is not that at all. But when you go to the commandments and Jesus fulfilled the commandments and you even go to the commandments today, um, <clears throat> even for us today, there needs to be a day in the week that you set aside as a Sabbath day that you give reverence and honor and glory unto God. Now, we're going to help you out on that. We've done that for on Sunday, and we still do it on Sunday, and so we encourage you to come to downtown Baptist Orlando and to have that as your Sabbath day, a day that you worship, a day that you rest, but whatever day that that is, but it, John says that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. This would have been on a Sunday. It would have been on a Sunday, not a Saturday, not a Saturday, and so remember, we're not under the law uh, anymore. Uh, he says, I was on the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet. Um, notice uh, he was in the Spirit. This is not a trance. This, he is not hallucinating. The word in Greek uh, for trance is specific, and it is not used here in Revelation. <clears throat> John was not under some type of narcotic influence, was you know, not taking any type of drug or anything. John knew exactly what was happening to him. He knew that he was in the spirit. Notice that he was in the spirit, not out of his mind. He knew what was happening. So John, <clears throat> through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is using very precise language to tell us, listen, I know what was happening. I was not hallucinating, nor was I having a trance. The Holy Spirit, in the same way, took John, when we get to Revelation chapter 4, to a transcendent place that only he can do. You can't do that if you're hallucinating. This is a wonderful, miraculous, and mighty work of the Holy Spirit. This was a place where God could show John what he needed to see for him in order to write so that we could read uh, today. Now, it says the voice behind him there in verse 10, uh, the voice uh, and, and the person behind him, the voice of a trumpet, a commanding voice. Uh, back in military times, in ancient military times, they would use drums or use trumpets or horns in order to convey to the troops a new maneuver, where they needed to go, what they needed to do, and when they uh, needed to stop. Uh, <clears throat> the trumpet there is mentioned in also 1 Corinthians 15:52, uh, and then also in 1 Thessalonians 4:16. Um, um, with the shout of the voice, with the trumpet of God, it's a commanding voice. And the trumpets, the trumpet was used in the worship of the tabernacle of God in the tabernacle in the temple because, it, well, guess what? It would signify it was ready to worship for them to come to the place of worship. Well, 
one day we're going to hear a trumpet sound and it is commanding us to come to him. So it's a commanding uh, voice. It says this, a loud voice as a trumpet, not, not a trumpet here, but a commanding voice as a trumpet. Now notice in verse 11, what it is saying now, it says, I am the alpha and omega, the first and the last. What you see or write in a book and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia. Now he enumerates the churches, uh, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. <clears throat> so those are the seven churches. And then in verse 12, it says, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke uh, with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And so the lampstands are the churches. When you go over to Revelation 1, verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars, which are, I mean, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, then you go down, it says, uh, and the seven lampstands, which are the seven churches. And so um, Jesus is always in our midst, and we allow him, and, and uh, he is always in our midst, he, uh, and we must allow him in our midst. So we've got to make sure that we don't quench his work uh, in us. Also, too, it is symbolic of um, that candle, that lampstand, symbolic of the menorah that would have been in the temple or in the tabernacle, because it represented the light of God to let them know that he was in their midst. Well, it is also the same and is true for us, uh, it just in a reverse sense. So now we're looking at the Son of Man uh, in um, verse 13. So he's in the midst of the lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands is one, like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a gold band. Uh, this cloth or this and gold band that he is having is symbolic of the priesthood. The priest would wear robes to cover them, and the high priest would wear a gold band, uh, which contained uh, the 12 stones, which had written on the 12 stones, the 12 tribes of Israel, and it was right here around his chest. So we're seeing that Christ is our great high priest, which is also mentioned many times and given many um, uh, uh, picturesque readings of that in the book of Hebrews. Now, as we continue to talk about the Son of Man, uh, God here, it says, uh, notice that this garment is from his shoulders all the way down to his feet with the, golden, uh, with, with the gold band. Verse 14, his head and hair were white as wool, as white as snow. Uh, the color white signifies he is ancient. Uh, that he is before all things, reminds us that we, we have to remember that Christ is pre-incarnate, that Jesus didn't start existing at the incarnation, that he is before all that. Christ preceded creation. He is the ancient of days, one of my favorite Old Testament uh, signifiers of who, who Christ is, or God is, the ancient of days, letting us know that Christ is eternal. He has never had a stopping point, and he has never had a starting point. The color of his hair also recognizes, signifies his uh, supposed to be his holiness and purity. Um, also, too, it says eyes like a flame of fire, representative of the penetrating gaze of Jesus. There is nothing concealed from his knowledge. You can't, you can't hide it. So it's better to go ahead and confess sin now while you have the opportunity than to wait till you get to heaven and it's made public. And uh, so do it in private or do it in public. I would prefer to do it in private. Thank you, Jesus. All right. So not only that, feed is fine brass tells us of his eternal strength in judgment. Uh, brass is, is metal. Uh, it's not as hard as titanium or aluminum, uh, but it is very hard metal in that day and age. And, but it tells us of his strength in judgment, and we will see that strength in judgment, excuse me, come up later on uh, in <clears throat> the book of Revelation, especially starting uh, in verse, I mean, in chapter 6, all the way through uh, chapter 20. And so we will get to that. <clears throat> So <clears throat> uh, that was in verse 15. His feet were like fine brass as, in re as refined in a fire and his voice as the sound of many waters. Um, think of a waterfall been to Niagara Falls. Uh, you know how loud it is. It catches your attention. So his voice is commanding. It is heard. No one will be able to say that they have not heard his voice and it is understood 100% completely. There will be no ambiguity with Christ. Uh, at that time. Uh, his right hand holds the seven stars. His right hand is, is the hand of power. You always see that in the Old Testament, um, that also with kings today, 
if their child is the crown prince or princess who is going to be the next in line, they will send that child to their right at their right hand, their hand of power. So uh, Jesus in his right hand has um, uh, the seven stars in his hand. It is a sign of power, a sign of protection, but it is also a sign of promise. These stars are the angels or the messengers to the churches. They are the pastors of these churches. The pastor of each church are in the hand of Jesus, which is where the pastor receives his power, protection, and promise. And to that, I say a, amen. So uh, all right. also, too, when you go and uh, go on as from verse 15 now to verse 16, again, he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Uh, the sharp two-edged sword is the same sword that is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 13. Same sword that we, that uh, uh, that the believer uses in spiritual warfare. It's the same sword that spoke creation, the same sword that called us, and is the same sword that will uh, save us. All right? Uh, his look, how does he look? His countenance shining, is the sun shining in its strength. Holy, holy, holy. It, it, get, it is that picture uh, that we have seen before in Isaiah chapter 6, in the book of Ezekiel, in the book of Daniel, and now here in the book of Revelation. It is his holiness. I mean, if, if you had to pick one attribute of God to stand out above all else, it would probably more or less be the holiness of God as compared to uh, his love. And so it is God's holiness. Now, the response to seeing Jesus, how does John respond in verse 17? And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. And it goes on there. Falling down, this is universal in Scripture. Isaiah 6, 5, Ezekiel 1, 28, Daniel 8, 17, Daniel 10, 7 through 9, and Luke 5, 8. That when people have this encounter, this, inglori this glorious encounter with Christ, their first reaction is to fall prostrate before him. It is a sign of reverence. What are we going to do when we get to heaven? Just as John did, uh, did right here, we will do the same. John sees Christ in his full eternal regalia attire and all of his form in his glorified state as he had already seen previous on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now he sees it in full, full display. Um, I believe probably on the Mount of Transfiguration it was probably more of a glimpse, but now he sees Christ as he really, really, truly is, and he can't help but just worship him. He falls prostrate at the feet of Jesus. Um, notice, too, you see uh, Luke's response. Now you see Jesus's response. Do not be afraid. Every time God encounters someone, he always tells them, do not be afraid, because when you're in the holiness of God, you realize who you are real quick and how sinful we are, and we can't help but be fearful, because when you're when we know who we are and we get in the presence of, of God, and even though John is saved, we realize how sinful we are. We're hoping that we're not going to be judged as well, you know, even though judgment has passed. So Jesus wants us to worship, uh, wants us to worship, uh, but not out of fear. Uh, it's supposed to be out. Uh, Genesis 15, 1. Uh, Abraham has that when uh, God shows up with the two angels before they go down to Sodom and Gomorrah. Also, uh, Genesis 26, uh, 24, Judges 6, 23 um, uh, there, and then Matthew 14, 27. All right, and also John's response, what was John to, redo, uh, John to do? So he fell at his feet as dead. Now in verses 18 through 20, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Right out of the mouth of Jesus, we know that he is living now. And I have the keys of Hades and death, that Jesus is the one who has power over life. Write these things which you have seen, the things which you, I mean, things which are, and the things which will take place after this. John is to write the things in the past, the things that he has seen which he has just seen right now in Revelation chapter 1, uh, right in the past. Uh, the vision uh, John just saw again in verses 12 through 17, all right? In the preceding verses, really up to uh, verse 1, but those are all introductory verses. Then it says, the things which are, uh, this is the present, uh, the letters to the seven churches. This would be chapters 2 through 3. That is the present time, the time in which John lived. And then he says the things 
which much uh, things which will take place after this. That is the future, right? The future events, chapters four through twenty-two. So that's what John is, is to write. That is his response. That's what he is commanded to do. So, folks, this is chapter one of uh, Revelation. Uh, as we get uh, into it next time, we will start covering the seven churches. We are going to cover each church separately. It is good that we do that. And, uh, and the reason is, is that each church is different. I do not believe that they represent church history, but they do represent churches today. And hopefully um, our church isn't like that here at downtown Baptist Orlando. We're either like the church at Smyrna or the church at Philadelphia, where God, where Jesus does not condemn them, but he commends them. Uh, for their works. I hope that your church is like that, where you go, that Jesus is commending you, but not having to pass any type of judgment uh, on any of you fine folks. So uh, that concludes our lesson for today. Hope you enjoyed it. Know that you can go back at any time, watch this over again, take more notes if you need to. I appreciate that you, uh, that you tuned in and just know, hey, guess what? He is coming back and that is our greatest hope that we have. Thank you, each and every one who has tuned in today. Love each and every one of you. And I hope that you have a great Lord's Day at the place that you choose to worship this Sunday as we worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords.